Aloha, everyone, and welcome back to Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Mitch Ewan. And today on the show, our guest is Toby Kincaid, my old friend from way back when, who's been on the show several times, and now is the publisher of Green Hydrogen, Hydrogen Today, which is a new magazine. We'll be discussing how green hydrogen is sprouting up everywhere in the globe. It seems not a week goes by without the announcement of yet another green hydrogen roadmap from a country or a mega green hydrogen production plant. So welcome to the show, Toby. Thank you, aloha, Commander. Good to be with you. Great to see you. So uh, let's start uh, with you introducing yourself and uh, why you started your new magazine. Well, um, really for two reasons, uh, a personal reason and a professional reason. The personal reason is kind of twofold. Uh, last summer, uh, we burned up and it kind of brought it home. Uh, we're in a climate disruption. I mean, in Oregon, it used to be April showers bring May flowers. Well, now it's April drought brings May doubt. And uh, we're seeing a very serious situation. So on the personal side, I've, I've, I've always had an, an er a yearning to want to be involved with solutions. and. Uh, then on the professional side, what's what's really happened uh, in this last year, and you predicted it, is that something is moving and the whole world has woken up. Uh, and it really started in Hawaii when you declared your 100% uh, renewable energy goal for 2045, you lit a fire under the world. And now 72 countries are following your lead. 32 of them have declared their path. How are they actually going to decarbonize? And the leaders right now are the European Union. They have taken it seriously. They're calling it the European Green Deal, which is really a green hydrogen deal because that's what they're focused on in, in real solutions. And, and it, you know, that message is coming through around the world that you know, 30 years ago, 80% of the world runs on fossil fuel. That was 30 years ago. You know what the percentage is now? 81. Ah, so we, so we haven't going. made... Yeah, we, we really haven't made much progress. I mean, the world has grown so much, it's absorbed all of the clean energy that we've put into it. Oh, yeah, right. But it's really Mount Everest. If we actually want to survive, and, uh, you know, the World uh, Wildlife Fund reported recently that since the 70s, 50, no, 80% of all the flora and fauna species around clean water bodies have disappeared. 80% in, since, the, since when I was a kid. So uh, this is a very serious situation. And, and it was really around Thanksgiving uh, of this last year that I thought, you know, we, you know, as we all are facing our humanity, our mortality, our, you know, how fragile we are and how right. fragile life is. So I took a, a, another look at what's going on around the world. And it was really this conference in Singapore, which just lit a fire under me. I was so impressed with the Pacific Rim, the, the, the Singapore, uh, Korea, Japan, and especially Australia has now embraced this green hydrogen world. And they see it as a way to actually decarbonize, to, to get us off of carbon. So professionally, I thought, you know, this industry has matured so much, we really need a trade journal. So yeah. uh, for some reason, I decided to set myself to that task. And I'll tell you, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful to, to not know what you don't know. <laughs> but well, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, throw up the yeah. cover of this uh, new trade magazine while, while you're talking. Uh, wonderful. So there you go. I, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you. When I, when I first conceived it, I thought, well, I want to publish a magazine. I've always loved magazines. I think it's, it's graphic. It's, 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 it's wonderful. What a great uh, genre. So I always thought I would do a print magazine. Well, as I looked into it, I realized, hey, we do live in the 21st century. And now we have all these modern tools. And, and one of those, uh, two very big ones, is the Apple App Store and Google Play. Now, they have distribution all over the world. Uh, uh, the Apple App Store reaches 170 countries. And I'm very happy to report, since we've been up in the last week and a half, we've had downloads in 11 countries. Really? Singapore, Hong Kong. Poland, Korea, uh, the Netherlands, UK, I, I, I was stunned. And so there's a hunger out there. there. People need a solution and they need a real solution. 
And right. so I set myself to it and uh, it was, I got to say, it was rough. I mean, there's a lot of details, and but anything worthwhile is going to be a little tough. So just like any good fight, you know, you keep swinging halfway through, you keep swinging and hopefully you'll end up still on your feet. And it, it took a, a while. It was a mind bender because of all of the security layers and so forth. It's a complicated thing to build an app. But yeah. why build an app? Well, you need an app to go onto these platforms because there's so many different computers, so many different operating systems and sizes, and they all have to talk to each other. So right. it was really, you know, don't throw me in the briar patch, but boy, I was in it. <laughs> it took me four months uh, every day to get through it, but we did get through it. We're up live and it, it, it's really an amazing Amazing thing that that the creative process that if you have it in your head, you can actually get it out through your hands and out into the world. And so I'm, I'm this is my first child. I'm I'm, I'm proud to say. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to say that uh, I'm probably <laughs> one of your first customers, and yeah. I actually downloaded the app and the magazine over the weekend, so I can vouch that it actually works, <laughs> and uh, you can download it and. Um, You've got a special offer too, right? For the first uh, the first three months are free. That's right. So if you uh, sign up for the year, first three months, there's no obligation. If you want to say, hey, this isn't for me, no harm, no foul. But I sure hope that I can catch everyone to, to join in in this collaborative effort to focus on real solutions and, right. and the economic engine that a real solution is. Because a solution isn't a problem, it's a solution. It's how we can get through this. And so I'm, I've been amazed. I've had tremendous feedback and I'm, I'm a little bit stunned and, and very, very happy to say so. Well, I think uh, during the show will be, uh, some of our slides will just be general content to, just to, uh, yeah, just to give you a samples take. of your content yeah. that you're throwing out there. We don't expect anybody to actually read all the print and everything like that. It's just to show you, you know, what kind of subjects you're addressing. So let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about it. We talk about the green hydrogen and how it's popping up everywhere. So, well, tell as, us about it. Well, as you predicted, uh, the world is organizing around this, and and you know, countries like Chile and and Korea. Now, these are countries that don't have a lot of fossil fuels, and if you can imagine trying to compete with the rest of the world as these small countries, it takes a lot of chutzpah, it takes a lot of gumption to say, hey, you know. We've talked to our scientists and we've looked at everything. And if, if we're in Chile, we have huge solar resources in the north. We have Patagonia wind in the south. And we have micro hydro in the mountains in the middle. Why don't we create green hydrogen and sell it to the Pacific Rim? And that is impressive. Takes They're a actually effort. a powerhouse. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, who would have ever thought of Chile as being a, an energy superpower? Yeah, exactly. Well, they have the resources they are yeah and then and, uh, I, I just want to make one point is that uh, the investments are matching the visions so we're not talking millions of dollars that these countries are allocating they're allocating billions of dollars that's with a b out there everyone just so you know these are significant large investments like the eu is like 17 billion dollars they've allocated uh, uh, per year, Th they are going full tilt. In fact, the European roadmap uh, and, and what they're putting their money into, they're, they're creating hydrogen hubs, green hydrogen hubs, all over Europe, particularly the port of Rotterdam. And they're going after the tough stuff. They're going after the things that we wouldn't normally address and are the last to, to fix, which is steel, cement, uh, ammonia, these feedstocks that are so intensive with fossil fuels you know just for ammonia i think three percent of all the fossil fuels in the world burned are to make that material and why and do we the, have ammonia just tell the people why yeah it, it's well it, it's the basis of fertilizer right. and with all of the the major agricultural farming around the world I, now personally i like organic farming in a small scale but nevertheless you, you, these are this is an 800 billion dollar a year industry and so the idea is how can we make green ammonia and, and what's green? And what's green mean, Toby? Well, Just green means no carbon, no carbon at all. So, for example, if you make steel, you've got to make coke first, which is just burned up carbon that gets all the impurities out. 
and then they add the coke to the steel to, to regulate how much carbon goes into it, and then they blast furnace that, and it's just tremendously polluting. Same with ammonia. We use it for fertilizer all over the world. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an $800 billion industry. Very few accidents. It's very, very carefully managed, but uh, it's very right now to make the hydrogen that they stick to the nitrogen, they use the steam methane reforming. So they're using fossil fuels, methane, and you produce 10 tons of carbon dioxide for every one ton of, of hydrogen. And that's what's going on in the world. So the entire world industry of hydrogen, just in converting to a green hydrogen base using renewables to make it out of water. So, you know, it's amazing. We could make an equation. If you have sunlight and water, you have hard currency. Since sunlight falls in a distributed way everywhere, and whether it's sunlight directly or wind, which is a result, you put that through a machine called an electrolyzer, add water, and suddenly you have hydrogen and oxygen. So the waste product is the oxygen. They just let it go. There's actually a, a drive for a whole oxygen market based on the, the waste product of electrolyzers. Well, it's actually, we need oxygen. You know, as the COVID uh, um, mm. uh, pandemic uh, showed i mean uh, here in hawaii our hospitals uh, and certain hospitals ran out of uh, oxygen mm. and the industrial gas suppliers couldn't resupply it fast enough and Dimension. they actually phoned me up and asked if i could provide uh, oxygen for my site over at the uh, on the big island at the nelha site because wow. they're yeah. so they're really concerned about it so yeah uh, and this pandemic is going to keep on going. I mean, probably at a much reduced rate. We're getting much better at it. But it just goes to show you that, you know, in times of uh, emergency like this, um, we, we really need to have, have the adequate, adequate supplies and backups ready to go, like a contingency plan. Absolutely. And, and when we look at real solutions and we do the math, um, you know, it's very popular for for uh, institutions to say, well, we're very agnostic about what the solution will be. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But I would remind everyone, if you ever go to a horse track, not that I do, but I, I challenge you to find a gambler that's agnostic about putting their bet on, oh, just pick a horse. Yeah, right. No, no, they pick winners. They researched it. They try. We've got to decide, well, we have to, you know, fish or cut bait. Uh, the fact is uh, we're falling off uh off the the table here i mean as you know in texas last uh winter you know they're reporting it as well the severe storms of that era and it wasn't a severe storm we had a polar vortex the entire top of the world fell off and went down all the way to the gulf coast right over texas and you went from maybe you know 40 degrees to 40 below in in a matter of hours and how many critters have been killed you know, when, when the world starts jerking around like that, I, I think the writing's on the wall. And fortunately, and, and really Hawaii, we, we owe you for, for breaking the log jam, for saying, hey, we can't go on like this. We have to find something better. And fortunately, we do have something better. And that's green hydrogen. That's using renewable energy to make hydrogen fuel from water. And the good news is when you use the fuel, you get most of the water back. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the human beings, we're mostly made of water. I think we're like 74% water, very similar to the proportion of water on the earth, which is interesting. But yeah. water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. So in this case, if we base everything instead of hydrogen stuck to a carbon, that's door number one. Let's go to door number two, where hydrogen is stuck to oxygen, and that's water. And as you've pointed out, you're in Hawaii, you're surrounded by oceans of energy. And so all we need to do is put renewables into that. And now anyone, anywhere uh, can, can have all of the energy they want in modern living. And this is really the message. You know, you and I have talked about technology and history, how each century, the 18th century, we had revolutions in engine technology. We went from, from the 18th to the 19th, we went from external combustion with steam engines to internal combustion with piston engines. And then in the 20th century, we went to jet turbines. Well, now in the 21st century, it's going to be this electron engine, which is a com combining electrolyzers and fuel cells in one power block. And right. this is just wonderful for balancing the grid. For example, one big market that's emerging is called FCAS, Frequency Control and Ancillary Services. And what happens in California is they have a lot of renewables, but sometimes they have so much renewables, they have to curtail it. They have to turn it off. 
So with this little uh, um, uh, green hydrogen ability, you can actually, if the voltage is too high, you just turn on the electrolyzer and that'll add a load and pull it down. If the voltage is too low, you turn on the fuel cell to take the hydrogen you bubbled earlier and, and, and boost up that frequency. So what we're seeing is all of these manifestations of, of how you could use green hydrogen in our existing market and, and actually do a much better job than, than what we all have to face is that fossil fuels are toxic. And, yeah. and how, yeah. long, how long can you do it? Yeah, I, I read an article uh, in the APOC Times today, which said that California is asking people who own electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, not to charge their vehicle during the peak hours because it's going to cause, you know, they just don't have the, uh, the, the grid, can't handle the wires, can't handle the electricity. Absolutely. Because everybody's a, got their air conditioner on. It's the, you know, probably the hottest part of the day. They're coming home from work. They're turning on all their stuff. And now they're asking electric vehicle, uh, battery electric vehicle people, not to charge their cars, which is not a problem with hydrogen cars. And that's a big point. You know, when you operate a grid, it's, it's, it's called an independent system operator, an ISO. These are the guys, they don't own anything. They just manage the grid, but they've got to keep a very dynamic situation in balance. Demand and supply have to match. If your demand goes up, it's going to brown out your grid. If demand goes down, you're going to have arc flash and have danger of electricity trying to find a path. So it has to be an absolute balance. And, and, and that's a difficult thing to do. When we talk that you bring up the, the debate that's now happening between an EV all battery infrastructure and an EV fuel cell infrastructure, they're entirely different. But as you would point out, there are big advantages to going with the fuel cell because you don't need to touch the grid during peak at all. Right. We bubble the hydrogen on off peak times or during peak with solar, but that's, that's a great thing because you, want, you have now something to do with, something to use the solar for. So this is a tremendous, uh, it's tremendously difficult to do this. So, now we're only talking in California less than one or two percent of the fleet, and you're still having problems. You know, wow! Yeah. So you know what? Now there's a very big business in the utility sector in, involved with planning, because right. you have to plan what resources they need to schedule, and they schedule capacity, which just is kind of a spinning reserve. Then they they reserve the amount of electricity they might need, and it becomes very expensive. If you just go willy nilly plugging in batteries, how can they plan for that? There's, there's really no way. And what's that, that's gonna do is cause them to have to schedule more capacity. And that means your prices are gonna go up. So it's very unmanageable. And that's the point. The, 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 the fuel cell model that you've been developing, like the picture behind you, it, it's, uh, it allows you to, to, to uh, help the grid instead of harm the grid. Instead of being a burden to the grid, now you're helping balance the grid, and that has a great stabilizing effect. And, and of course, being 100% non-toxic, that's the, that's the shape of the future. Well, and you can also fill your car in five minutes as well. Absolutely. Imagine a 1,000 EVs, all battery, charging. And even with DC fast charge, by the time you go all the way through it, eh, you're probably close to an hour, maybe a little yeah. bit less. So for every 1,000 vehicles, uh, the fuel cell car, you know, fills up in less time that you are the same time you use in gasoline. Totally uh, familiar to us. But, uh, you know, a thousand hours every week, those EV all battery people are going to face. That has a cumulative effect as well. Uh, and so when we just cut through all of it, the answer is actually very straightforward and it only involves a, a few kinds of components. Yeah. So what you've been developing in Hawaii is just vitally important because you're demonstrating to everyone how they can make their own energy. Exactly. And that really brings us to the big point. What's one of the largest, you know, almost insurmountable issues of humanity is inequity. Now, if energy is a commodity, which it is today, you're you, talking, you're it, talking you about social, you're talking about social equity. Yes, in this case, uh, the, the, the fact that, that energy is a commodity means that a billion people are in abject poverty around the world. I mean, just right. serious poverty. But with your green hydrogen scenario, all we need to do is get them the right kit, the right gear, 
the right, right hardware, and they're completely independent. And look what this does. Imagine uh, countries like Guatemala. We're talking right. about this migration issue. Well, if you get green hydrogen into Guatemala, they're just going to make bed and breakfasts and ecotourism, and they'll realize where they are is far more valuable than moving anywhere else. And it will have a great stabilizing effect on, on, on the, human, uh, the human state. And, and so I see just enormous positive upside to us actually uh, obsoleting fossil fuels. Well, no. one, uh, one, one thing that just came up in the last couple of weeks is uh, looking at saving our trees because trees absorb uh, carbon dioxide. But if you look at some countries, like if you look at a uh, satellite view of Haiti, and the, I think it's the Dominican Republic, mm. uh, you look at the satellite in Haiti, it looks like a desert because people and the Dominican Republic side is this lush green jungle. That's because on the, the Haiti side, the Haitian side, um, people come and cut all the trees down uh, for firewood. And yeah. that's what they use to, for cooking and probably a little bit of heating or whatever. And they've totally denuded the landscape. And so um, there's obviously there's no carbon sequestration there. And, uh, mm. But with sunlight and water, they could be um, meeting their cooking uh, requirements, their heating requirements, even their fuel requirements for the vehicles. And that would let the trees grow and you'd be absorbing carbon dioxide and sequestering it, storing it. So, well, I love that. I love that idea as an Oregonian. It's a you know? pretty simple solution, actually. So Absolutely. I thought uh, in our remaining time, we could just do a quick little walk through some oh, of, uh, of your slides. So let's, uh, let's have the next slide up and, and you can uh, just, just to show you uh, what green hydrogen today looks like. And you may comment on it as we go through. Sure. The, the one you're looking at now was was uh, was a green hydrogen hub in Chile, uh, that what we just talked about a bit, and uh, and what I like to try, you know, my our typesetting skills are growing, but it's just the imagery of some of these these photographs we can get are just so beautiful. It reminds us of what we're doing. And if we jump to the next slide, there's another sleeping giant, and that's the uh, hydrogen hub, the green hydrogen hub that's going to grow in India. Right. India is the sleeping giant of the world. Uh, they're talking very risk realistically about in a few years trying to get to a few percent of their installed capacity, but that's billions of dollars. I mean, Bloomberg News reports that in the next five years, $740 billion will go into the green hydrogen space. And what Bloomberg is realizing is, is that they can sense it, that there's, there's movement afoot, that the world is actually waking up they're finding solutions and finding a, pra a profitable path to right. implement those solutions. And that's the key. Exactly. So let's have the next slide up. Oh, this is an interesting article on floating wind farms. Now, it, most wind farms offshore, are, are, are they have a lot of problem because of the visual impact that people don't care for. And right. also the undersea cables are rather expensive, actually. Yep. But there's a group in the Netherlands who have come up with a very clever idea of floating wind turbines out in the North Sea and using their retired uh, platforms that they used for oil drilling. Uh, that's where they mount the electrolyzers. Right. And then what they're going to do is tap into their existing natural gas pipelines that they used to import that gas from the North Sea, and they're going to convert it over to hydrogen. So now they've got a built-in transmission and distribution system, and that's phenomenal. And this concept, it was really started by the Germans called Power to Gas. And they point out that the, the, the storage capacity of the, of the natural gas pipelines is terawatts of energy. So you don't need to build a battery. You, you could create the hydrogen, which is the battery, and put it through the gas pipeline, and that stores it. There's a great re a study done by Dr. Brower at the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Fuel Cell Partnership in Southern California. And they did a study where they actually modeled how to power the entire state of California with green hydrogen. Quite impressive. And they inject, they have out in the desert, uh, like a 20 mile area of, of uh, solar farms, and that would make hydrogen. They inject it into the existing line right at the Arizona border. And it goes all the way into the LA basin, to the port of LA, to the Long Beach. They, they just have it all worked out. And they worked out the percentage was something like 60% wind and 40% solar. They found it very complimentary at night, the wind goes up. During the day, the sun goes up, 
And by balancing it through this, this hydrogen as the battery, all of the grid operators are happy. They, can, they, they, they know when to turn on the resources they need. I just was so impressed. Dr. Brower, I, I, I applaud you. And we'll be writing you up shortly. Okay, next slide. <laughs> oh, this is a very interesting piece on, uh, on uh, uh, green hydrogen and aviation. Uh, drones, you know, how do, how, how do we live without drones now, right? Well, drones right. only last about 20 minutes in flight time, typically, uh, with the battery packs that they have. But you can get four hours out of the drone that you're looking at with that little bottle of hydrogen and a fuel cell on board. So I'm very excited about this because a heavy lift drone would allow us to take uh, uh, firefighting materials directly out to where the spark is uh, and, and reach it by air and then drop that, that, uh, that retardant right on the, the little hot spots. So sure. I'm very excited about the firefighting potential of green hydrogen in drones. So this is the kind of thing we're trying to look at all of the different exciting avenues and exciting projects that are really coming on board. And I am flabbergasted. I've just spent three days in a conference out of Montreal, the ninth uh, annual World Hydrogen Technology Conference. Yeah. And watch out for the Canadians. Boy, they're getting it. You better watch out. Uh, they are gunning for this. Uh, the people at Hydro-Quebec, which has been a long time hydrogen, green hydrogen provider, actually. They've yeah. been a hydrogen hub for decades. I think NASA buys most of our, our uh, hydrogen fuel for, for space flight. Uh, from Hydro Quebec and, and affiliates, and so now we're we're looking in in this next issue. We're focusing on uh, the green hydrogen hub of Canada and specifically British Columbia and Alberta. Now Alberta is a really interesting story because they're a major exporter of fossil fuels, but even they are beginning to look at the Pacific Rim and going, hmm, they don't really want to buy our fossil fuels anymore. They are declaring that they want to buy green hydrogen as close to green hydrogen as, as possible. Will they buy a little blue hydrogen? That's still made from methane and then they try and sequester the CO2. But there's, there's no real easy way to do that. And, and by the way, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Why would you put billions of dollars into trying to put the genie back in the bottle when you have the option of not letting her out? Yeah. Exactly. So it let's go to our sense. last slide because uh, we're running out of time. Oh, so, so fast. Freeze through 29 and a half minutes. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it, it, this article was about the, who I consider the founding father of green hydrogen, um, Augustine Machaut. And Machaut was a French mathematician in the 1860s and 70s, and he built all kinds of contraptions, solar concentrators, he distilled uh, liqueurs, he, he, he would cook for the, for the French Legion in North Africa with solar powered cookers. This guy was amazing. But what he really did, which was off the hook, in the early 1870s, as he took his, his solar concentrator and he learned about Seebeck, who built thermal piles, uh, thermal couples. You can take different metals and stack them up like Volta did basically and make a battery, but it, re it reacts with heat. So at the boundary layer between the different metals, you cause an electricity to flow. So what this guy did is he built one, he concentrated solar energy on it, made enough, made enough amps to power an electrolyzer and made hydrogen fuel in, in his garden in Tours in, in 1870. Okay, so, Toby, let's oh, go to the last slide. because Oh, yeah, please. So. so here's our logo. Uh, we're available on the App Store and Google Play. If you, if you, uh, you know, on, on the App Store, all the apps are free. You can download any app for free. Inside the app, they'll have what they call in-app purchases. So that's when you can decide if you want to buy something. In, in our case, I, I would encourage everyone to grab a free, uh, grab a subscription, you get that free three month, and then you can decide if you don't want it, that's fine. Uh, so it won't cost anything. Please have a look at it and uh, we'd love to have your feedback. And uh, you know, the green hydrogen is going global and uh, we're honored to be a part of that. Well, thanks a lot, Toby. It's been great having you on board. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there we have it. We're going to leave it here. Uh, you've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. And today we've been discussing the global movement to green hydrogen and a hydrogen economy with uh, Toby Kincaid, the publisher of Green Hydrogen Today. And thanks to the viewers, all your viewers out there for tuning in. And I'm Mitch Ewan, and we'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy.